Hi, this is Saqib Rahman from the Orthoclips podcast series. And uh, today we are talking with Dr. Scott Lavalva, who's a PGY4 orthopedic resident at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And the title of our podcast is Do Robotics and Navigation Increase Infection Risk in Total Hip, Ar uh, total hip Arthroplasty? Uh, thank you, Dr. Lavalva, for coming on the podcast. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahman. Really appreciate you having me on. Um, excited to to chat about our work. We're we're pretty excited about it. Great, yeah. You uh, and your group published a paper. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about. It was entitled "Robotics and Navigation Do Not Affect the Risk of Periprosthetic Joint Infection Following Primary Total Hip Arthroplasty: A Propensity Score Matched Cohort Analysis." A little bit of a mouthful. This was in the April third, twenty. Uh, 24 JBJS issue, but basically you kind of state the results uh, right there in the, in the title. So, um, so we'll get into it, but why don't you tell me first, how did you get interested and involved in this study? And then, you know, kind of the group also um, why you guys decided to look into this, but I'm also just per interested to hear your personal involvement. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in terms of the, con the original conception of the study, um, all the credit here really goes to the PI on the study, Dr. Alberto Carley, who's, who's really a renowned expert in PJI. So with that in mind, just by nature of Dr. Carley's research, clinical practice, and high rate of PJI referrals, it's, it's not surprising to imagine that he spends a ton of time thinking about this problem, both from a preventative and a therapeutic perspective. Um, and as anyone with experience treating PJI is well aware, uh, prevention is really of utmost importance given its hugely detrimental impact on patient morbidity, functional outcomes, and even mortality. So when we think about that in the context of si some significant trends in both hip and knee arthroplasty over the past decade, um, the rising utilization of technology assistance in the OR, whether that be computer navigation systems, the use of a robot, um, you know, it's really obviously a major one. Um, and then from a PJI perspective, we hypothesize that this could be important for two main reasons. Uh, first, the, the literature in general has shown that the use of technology leads to longer operative times compared to manual techniques, and that's on average, not for everybody. Um, and then second, anyone who's been in the OR for a robotic case knows very well that there just tends to be more going on in those rooms. Um, the room's a little more packed. There's additional personnel, additional trays, the actual robot itself, um, plus additional incisions for pins or arrays. So that sort of prompted our group to ask the question of whether each of these factors might increase the risk for contamination in the development of uh, periprosthetic joint infection after a total hit. Can I ask, you know, anecdotally, you said uh, you guys get a lot of you know, referrals also for PGIs. Anecdotally, were you under the impression that perhaps, well, it seems like your hypothesis were, were, was that there was no difference, but... Uh, so anecdotally, you were not seeing or maybe questionably were seeing, like maybe more of these were robotics or navigation, or were you hearing people talking about it, but you guys weren't really anecdotally seeing it? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say that we weren't necessarily anecdotally seeing a higher rate of PJIs or PJI referrals in patients who had robotic or navigated um, procedures. I think it was more of just the observation of being involved in those cases, like you can sort of, there's just a difference in those rooms when you're in a manual hip or knee and a robotic hip or knee, um, not necessarily better or worse, but that was the question we wanted to ask, right? So when you have all this other stuff going on, additional instruments, additional personnel, all of this other stuff, you know, obviously every, every arthroplasty surgeon is petrified of contamination. And so, and it's, and it's generally well, well aware of everything that's going on in the room. And so when you look around and see these other things going on, I think that sort of prompted the hypothesis or the question of, you know, do these things, does all this other stuff going on in the OR matter? And, and does it lead to an increased risk of contamination? Um, in addition yeah, to, you know, the other stuff, the operative time and whatnot. Right. And, and those things, you know, operative time in other studies has shown to correlate with uh, increased infection risk in some studies and then uh, increased, uh, you know, OR traffic or uh, exposure of trays um, due to, you know, airborne particles. So there, there are some evidence to certainly um, make that, uh, you know, po possible um, 
leap that uh, if that stuff is happening. So tell us about study. Let's let's talk a little bit more about the study design, uh, your results, what you found. You yeah, absolutely. That. So, you know, when we were thinking about the design of this study, we were, of course, we're thinking about it in the context of the prior literature that exists, looking at manual versus robotic or or manual versus navigated procedures. And, you know, there, there was a decent there, there's been a decent amount of that to date. Um, but most of those comparative studies have focused on identifying differences in things like implant position, stability, some patient reported outcome measures. And so they, they've either, one, not looked at PJI, um, two, looked at PJI, but as an underpowered secondary outcome variable, or three, looked at PJI and, and did not um, totally account for known confounders. And so with that in mind, we simply wanted to compare the incidence and the risk of PJI with, uh, within 90 days after total hip in patients who underwent manual hips, computer navigated hips, or robotic hips. Um, and we wanted to do that using a propensity score matched uh, analysis over a three year period at our institution. Um, and so in applying that methodology, we identified almost 13,000 patients who underwent primary unilateral um, total hip arthroplasty for osteoarthritis. Most of those, about 8,000 underwent manual total hip um, whereas 2,678 underwent navigated hip and 2,026 underwent robotic hips. Um, propensity score match cohorts were then developed uh, using a multivariable logistic regression model based on age, sex, BMI, smoking history, Charleston comorbidity index, surgical approach, data surgery, the order of the case, both by surgeon and by operating room, and then the anesthesia type. Um, so after matching, we essentially had two different types of, we essentially had two different analyses. There was, you know, first there was 2,644 manual hips, which were compared to the same number of matched navigated hips. And then we had a separate set of 2,003 manual hips, which were compared to the same number of matched robotic hips. Um, after matching for each of the groups, there were no significant differences in covariates between the groups. Um, on univariate analysis. And then, you know, the primary outcome of the study was the development of PGI within 90 days, which was defined according to the 2011 MSIS criteria. So in terms of our results, uh, first for the manual versus robotic hips, the mean operative time was 11 minutes longer in the robotic hips compared to manual hips, which was a statistically si significant difference and also clinically significant. Um, when looking at the development of PGI at 90 days, there were nine PJIs in the manual cohort compared to eight in the robotic cohort, which was a 0.4% incidence for both. And then our logistic regression analysis demonstrated that the use of robotic assistance was not associated with a difference in the rate of PJI. The odds ratio for that was 0 0.9 with 95% confidence interval of 0.3 to um, 2.3. And then similarly for the manual versus navigated hips, there was also a statistically significant difference in operative time between the groups but this was slightly less pronounced with an average of three minutes greater operative time in the navigated cohort. Um, in terms of the rate of PJI, there were six or a 0.2% rate in the manual cohort compared to 11 or 0.4% in the navigated cohort. But again, on logistic regression analysis, um, navigation was not associated with the difference in the rate of PJI. The odds ratio for that was 1.8, 95% confidence interval was 0.7 to 5.3. So really to summarize these findings, we found that despite longer operative times associated with the use of technology, uh, the use of these tools was not associated with an increased risk of PGI within 90 days of total arthroplasty. Um, want to briefly comment on the strengths and weaknesses uh, as kind of you, know, you, you discussed in the paper and you can just briefly uh, explain for our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the biggest strength, you know, we really just... I think our study design was relatively simple, straightforward, and we we focused on matching for essentially all of the confounders that we could have that we know impact the risk of PJI. So I think that, you know, we had a large single center study that was specifically aimed toward identifying if there's a risk between these cohorts. That was our primary aim. Our primary outcome variable was PJI, and we controlled for confounders. So we in terms of the context of the literature, that that was really the biggest strength of the study. Um, in terms of some weaknesses, you know, one, um, anytime you're looking at these types of studies at a single center, there's always question of external validity. Are these results, um, you know, comparable to other institutions? Are 
practices regarding, you know, infection control and all of these things are going to be different from institution to institution. So that's an important consideration. Another important consideration, our background infection rate is low. It's, it's 0.4, 0.5%. And so with that in mind, we, even though we were, um, our primary outcome was PJI, we did do a, um, a power analysis, which demonstrated that we had 80% power to detect a 2.4 to 2.7 fold increase in the likelihood of PJI in the technology cohort. So um, even though we were powered as best we could, we we're still a little bit underpowered. And so if there is a difference in the rates of, you know, 1.5 to two fold, for example, we may have been underpowered to detect that. Um, so I think that's an important uh, limitation of the study as well. Yeah, one, um, I think that's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, firstly, um, really well designed study in my opinion and uh, for, for looking at something, I think for looking at something that has a very low incidence. Um, so, you know, it is going to be hard to, um, you know, you, it's a retrospective you know, study and I think this might be something very difficult to design um, as some kind of, you know, randomized study or prospective study just because, you know, the numbers would have to be massive uh, given at least the infection rates at your institution. Um, the, uh, but and I think an honest assessment of the, the strengths and weaknesses and, you know, one other thing you, you talked about the generalizability, um, you know, looking at the data, um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, at your institution, there's a, you know, a lot of, uh, sort of, you know, selection, patient selection, and obviously, uh, a lot of institutional, uh, protocols and pathways to, to minimize infection. But, you know, patient selection, interestingly, in the same issue of the JBJS, uh, there is an article about, um, uh, you know, the ethics of doing total joints in obese patients. And uh, I think your average BMI, if I recall, was uh, like 28 to 29. So kind of in the overweight range, but, uh, I think a lot of people listening to this are thinking, um, <laughs> that's that if all their total joints are 28 to 29, uh, maybe they wouldn't have so many infections either. And, um, so does that matter? Do you think, uh, the, you know, the, the, the patient selection that is, um, if, if, if this was, you know, patient population where you're introducing those other factors, patient factors that are increasing risk for infection, you think the results, I mean, this is speculative, but the results likely still hold, or is there going to be something that's going to change uh, because of that? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. I wish that I had the, a, a range of, of BMIs in front of me for the patients we had in the study, because like you said, yeah, it's around 29, the mean. Um, I can tell you from an institutional perspective, because I, I actually am doing some other work looking at doing total hips, total knees and obese patients from our single institution. So we have plenty of patients who get um, arth who undergo arthroplasty in the 40, 45, 50, 55 range. Um, certainly not the majority, but we absolutely we, we do not utilize a strict BMI cutoff our, at our institution. And so while I can't say for certain, because I don't have the range in front of me, um, there were definitely patients in this cohort that, that, you know, sort of fell in that BMI over 40 range. But I think your point is extremely um, well taken. I think um, if I had to guess, um, we know that obesity increases the, the rate of almost all complications, including PJI. And so um, if anything, that would just increase our signal but I can't think of a, of a good reason why robotics or navigation necessarily would impact that risk of PJI differently in patients with a BMI 45, BMI 50, or, or BMI, you know, 28, 29. Um, but certainly possible and something we could, we could look at. Yeah. What, what kind of reception uh, have you had with the paper? Um... I know this is this was presented, uh, you know, national meetings for uh, I believe it was was it musculoskeletal, uh, um, in fact, yeah, the, yeah. Dr. Carley presented this as a podium um, 
in uh, 2023 MSIS, the Musculoskeletal Infection Society. Infection Society, right. So tell yeah. us, what, do, do you know what the reception's been or critique or sort of uh, praise for the study from the community? Yeah, I think overall the reception, fortunately, has been very positive. Um, you know, as we mentioned, this was presented at that meeting. This this paper was was fortunate to be accepted in JBGS. We actually performed an identical study for total knees um, and, and had similar findings, um, which was that there was no major difference. And this was recently published in the Journal of Arthroplasty as well. Um, I think in terms of, you know, the biggest critiques of the study, it, it's mostly the, the things that you know, we've been talking about and that we've been, we've been very, you know, upfront about, which is that um, it may be the case that we need either a registry, uh, you know, a national registry or a systematic review meta-analysis to sort of, to, to truly answer the question of whether technology is associated with a difference in the risk of PJI just because, you know, we were still relatively uh, underpowered. But overall, I think um, it has been well received because when we consider that the trend of robotics and navigation is not going anywhere and it's going to continue to grow in utilization. Um, and so to, to have this sort of reassurance that doesn't seem like all of those other things that we hypothesize are important in terms of the risk for PJI. Um, it's definitely something that, that surgeons and institutions are, are um, interested in. Great. Any last words you want to say about future directions? Um, you hinted at a few other projects you're working on, but for on this topic, uh, any future directions that are being considered? Yeah, I think, you know, like I sort of mentioned this, that our findings really provide reassurance in terms of infection risk with the use of intraoperative technology, um, which is an important consideration given the projected growth and utilization of these tools. But there are plenty of questions that remain that, that need to be answered as it relates to manual versus navigated or robotic procedures. Um, most importantly, whether their use is associated with an improvement in long-term outcomes. So whether that be, you know, things like stability, patient reported outcome measures, patient satisfaction, reducing the rate of short and long-term failure mechanisms, I think we really need to those data in order to ju justify the cost of widespread adoption of technology assistance in the operating room. And I think as a field, that's, that's going to be a really important and, and critical future direction. Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, and it's worth, if any of the listeners are wondering, um, I'll, I'll just say that there was no external funding uh, received for this study. Um, the uh, conflicts of interest seem to be pretty much nil uh, with the authors uh, on this. So of course, I'm sure the uh, the uh, robotics and navigation industry uh, will receive this paper very well. <laughs> However, um, no, uh, there's been no funding or uh, conflicts of interest declared by the authors in case listeners were wondering. Well, uh, I think this is... Um, a great topic, uh, lots of future direction for this. Uh, I think this does answer some questions in some surgeon's mind and uh, maybe centers uh, that are doing this and uh, you know maybe patients as well. Um, so I uh, want to thank you with that. We're gonna we're gonna conclude things. We've been talking with uh, Dr. Scott uh, Lavalva at uh, Hospital uh, for Special Surgery on uh, whether, Robotics and in, uh, navigation increase infection risk in total hip arthroplasty uh, from uh, his group's paper in the April 3rd, uh, 2024 JBJS. Uh, congratulations again on your uh, publication and uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Ramon. Thanks so much for the opportunity to come on and chat. It's been fun.